This is uh, IIoT, this is OEE and Industry 4.0, take zero. Here's an example of why IIoT and leveraging Industry 4.0 principles matters, okay? What I have on the board is an Industry 3.0 example of, uh, and ignore the machine learning cloud for the second. Um, I have an Industry 3.0 example of a traditional manufacturing environment. And, this, and let's say that this is an advanced manufacturer. So they've actually got an MES system, okay? So, let, let, and they've got a SCADA system, all right? So let, how does this work? Uh, in order for us to calculate OEE, how efficient is our plant running, or how efficient is our line running, or how efficient is any given area, um, I need to, I essentially have to have four variables for uh, e um, each calculation. I need to know in-feed, out-feed, waste, and state. That is, what's the total number of widgets that were fed into the machine? What are the total number that were produced going out? What was the total number of waste? And what's the state of the machine at any given time? I can, if I have two of these counts, I can derive any third one. So I, could, I can add outfeed and waste together to give my infeed. If I only have an infeed number and I've got waste, I can subtract waste from infeed to get the outfeed number. I can derive, so I only need to have two of them. Not every single machine will have all of these, but they will have state. You may have the operator tell you what the state is, but ideally it's coming from the equipment, okay? So what happens is, in, right now, is these are fed into the MES system to calculate availability, quality, performance, and OEE, okay? Um, the MES system gets the work order from the ERP system, okay? And also the schedule from the ERP system. So they are fed into the ERP system so that the production, the, the production supervisor or the line operator know what they're supposed to be running and when. The ERP system contains the whole schedule for my entire manufacturing facility. So here's the way that this works. The operator is looking at the MES system and he's looking at the SCADA system. In the Industry 3.0 application, we, the PLC is, is pushed, uh, pushing values into the MES system, giving you AQP and OEE, and he has a little pretty dashboard. You know, generally looks like this. Uh, availability, quality, and performance, and he's you know, he's got a, a line and it's all pretty, line is all pretty, but let's say the performance number is really low. Performance number is 50%. That's going to give him a low OEE number. So his OEE number is going to be low as well. Probably something in that neighborhood. What does that mean? What, what, let's say that the OEE target is here. And he's running here. What does that tell the operator? Tells the operator that whatever we scheduled this work order for, we're going to be late. Does it only impact that work order or does it or impact everything else after it? Like if, I, if I've scheduled, uh, it, it's, it, it, it impacts everything, the delivery of everything. Okay, in the OEE, in the MES 3.0 or the Industry 3.0 methodology, the operator sees a dashboard, sees this, sees his OEE is low, and he goes to his SCADA system and he turns the speed of the machine up to try and make up the performance number, try to produce more parts faster. But then what generally happens is he's producing more waste, so his quality number starts to drop. And he has to decide how fast do I run the machine? Do I turn it way up? Or you know how much how much waste can I accept? Does he know how much every part costs? No, that's over here. The ERP system calculates that. All right. So in the industry 3.0 methodology, you basically have this open loop. You have an operator looking at a dashboard and making these adjustments. If he's going to be late, does the planner know that he's going to be late? Nope. Has no idea he's going to be late. Does uh, if if he's going to if he overspeeds the machine? Does he know what? Yeah. Does he know that it's co it costs more money to produce waste than it does to deliver late? Of course not. All that information lives up here. Okay. So in the industry 3.0 methodology, you may think that you are optimizing, you're you're generating efficiencies, and you are. You capture efficiencies initially, but eventually you get to the point of this situation where the operator is not the appropriate person to make that decision. 
Where should that be done? Should be done in machine learning. Machine learning should be consuming from the ERP system, from the MES system, SCADA, and PLC to determine what is the optimal decision. And you can't do it with this architecture. And you cannot do it with the existing architecture. Okay? That's one of the reasons that you have to go to Industry 4.0 and leverage Industry 4.0 methodologies. And in order to do that, you have to leverage IIoT protocols and thinking. Primarily because your business is too big to use to do everything over Ethernet IP, right? Um, so, so that is the 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 industry 4.0 use case. And the industry 4.0 use case is he still has these dashboards, and he still sees his OEE, and he still sees the speed being adjusted. But what's happening is all of this information. is making its way into machine learning. Machine learning is looking at the schedule, it's looking at the, MEA, the OEE calculations, availability, quality, performance, and it's looking at the process information, and it's making an optimal decision. And then it pushes that decision down, and there could be a question. The, does it, the optimal decision might be adjust the speed set point by 0.7 up, and the operator may execute that. Long term, what's going to happen is machine learning is just going to write that into the PLC. And we're going to log it. Machine learning made a determination. Manufacturing holy grail. That's right. That's the manufacturing holy grail. That is OEE in Industry 4.0 in a nutshell. In, in your honest opinion, how long of a runway does a manufacturer have if they choose not to adopt this to be, remain viable in the market? Well, that's, that's dependent upon a couple of things. So um, the runway's not long. The runway's not long. If, if, you're not, if, you, if you don't have an IIoT strategy today, if you don't have an IIoT strategy today, if you don't have a digital transformation strategy today, it's and, it's, and it's not the correct, I mean, and again, it's important. There's a lot of posers out there. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there telling you that they can digitally transform your business, and what they're doing is painting you into a corner. Okay, I mean that's the reality, um, and 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 we and that's what we really learned over the course of this year. Uh, uh, the conversation I just had this morning about, you know, you want to know what I really learned in the last year? Hey, is digital media been worth it? That was a question that someone asked us this morning. Has the digital media digital marketing venture that we've done with Zach been worth it? And the answer has been absolutely yes. I mean, there's no question about it. We've gotten our message out. We've helped to start changing the way people think, um, et cetera. We've increased our pipeline. All the ancillary stuff that we never even intended on. We really thought, we thought this marketing venture was going to be an investment that we would, we would see a return on across the industry, not in our business. You know, we were really sacrificing the revenue in order to get the message out is ultimately what we're doing. The ancillary benefit was it actually increased our pipeline by 5x. I mean, our 12-week our, our, uh, pipeline went from x to 5x over a course of one year, okay? And it was already, x was already a big number, okay? <laughs> so the, the um, but what we've really learned over the course of the last year is just how little people know. I mean, just how there are people in, in, in positions of influence who literally are using smoke and mirrors and the client has no idea. The industry has no idea. They're finding out the hard way. Okay? They're really going to find out the hard way three to five years from now. You want to talk about the runway. How long do you have to have a digital transformation uh, plan in place? Um, if you don't have anything in place three to five years from now, it, it's going, you're going to be spending a ton of capital um, to try and catch up. There's no, no question about it. This is why Rockwell spent a billion dollars with the PTC partnership. Because Rockwell ultimately identified it. They ultimately realized, holy crap, we, we have been resting on our laurels and we are not positioned to capitalize on the change in the market. And that's the whole reason that happened. Okay, um, no, no question about it and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, the, the, the simple reality is that if you're still doing it this way, if you're still doing it this way three to five years from now, if you don't even have this in place three to five years from now, I mean, we just write you off. I mean, we can just, we can just write this, this, 
we can just write you off. Because if you don't have a mechanism for capturing these gains, which you will get just by providing visibility to these numbers, you, you will not be able to compete. And you can roll your eyes at me and all that stuff you know, right now if you want to. The difference is, I, and I happen to be right here. Um, um, the, 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 the reality is if you don't have this in place, you, you will not be in business. I mean, you, you will be fighting a, uh, you know, an uphill battle that you will not be able to, to overcome. So, um, but if this is what you have in place in three to five years and there's no digital transformation strategy in place, well then, let me ask you this. How do you think you can compete against the, the competitor who can do this? I mean, th this, these are decisions that are gonna happen in real time. These calculations are gonna take place every 10 seconds, every 20, better and, better. and better and better. I mean, how do you think you can compete against the customer who has this, has this in place? You won't. And you, we talked about the Tesla thing. This is a different rant. So let me go, let me go back to Tesla. So we've, we've worked with uh, Tesla before. Uh, not in integration, but in a previous life, we worked with Tesla. And, um, and when they were building their manufacturing facility in Northern California, okay? And it, you know, for those of you that don't know a lot about Elon Musk, what I can tell you about Elon Musk is that he's an incredibly hands-on executive in his company. He's a brilliant dude, very um, uh, technically capable, but he's incredibly hands-on in, in his in his operation. Most executives would have given up, had they been in, te in Elon Musk's shoes, most executives would have given up a hundred times over during that process. But at no point did Elon Musk ever waver in his commitment to leveraging cutting edge technology when he built his facility. Okay, and uh, all his facilities. At no point did he ever waver. The only, if, if he ran, if he, if he hired a partner and that partner didn't pan out, he had no problem cutting them loose and bringing in someone else and trying somebody else out. But his commitment to the technology didn't change, okay? That makes him different than most executives. Most executives will attribute the failure to the engagement to a failure of the technology, not a failure of the partner. Whereas Elon Musk attributed to a failure of the partner. Well, and it, it, he also attributed to a failure of his own people. Um, and, and he just said, I, I don't have the right team around me yet. But he, his commitment to the technology never wavered, never. Uh, Jeff Bezos is another good example. Um, that his commitment to the technology has never wavered. And the results speak for themselves. So, anyway, that's it.